Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to New Books and Philosophy, a podcast channel with the New Books Network. I'm Sarah Tyson, Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Colorado, Denver. And I'm co-host of the channel, along with Carrie Fictor, Robert Talese, and Malcolm Keating. Together, we bring you conversations with philosophers about their new books, drawing from a wide range of areas of contemporary philosophical inquiry. Today's interview is with Chris F. Seeley, Professor of Philosophy at, the, at Fairfield University. Her book, Creolizing the Nation, is just out from Northwestern University Press. Can the concept of the nation be a resource for liberatory political struggle? Are the dangers of nationalism simply too great? In Creolizing the Nation, Chris Seeley argues that creolization offers theoretical resources for imagining the possibilities of decolonial nations. Such new imaginings are made possible by the ways creolization allows us to think subjectivity, community, and history inventively. Seeley draws our focus to everyday practices of sabotage and and jostling as modes of creolization that deserve our attention. She creates conversations between the work of Edouard Glissant, Franz Fanon, Gloria Enzaldúa, Maria Lugones, and Mariana Ortega to theorize identity and community in terms of difference, flux, and ambiguity. Seeley gives us errant possibilities. Chris Seeley, welcome to New Books in Philosophy. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, well, it's great to talk to you with, with you this morning, and I, I want to hear about your background as a theorist and your interests um, and how you came to write this book, but we have some late-breaking news about an award you you were just honored with, so will you tell us about that? Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, late breaking indeed. I um, woke up on the morning of January 1st, 2022 um, with this news. Uh, so Creolizing the Nation was um, quite literally just um, awarded the uh, Nicolas Cristobal uh, Julien Batista Philosophical Literature Prize. Um, it's one of the outstanding book awards that the CPA um, awards every year. So um, it's an honor that the book is receiving from the Caribbean Philosophical Association. And uh, I couldn't be more thrilled because, um, you know, the CPA has been my intellectual community um, and so many folks in the CPA have invested in me and poured into me as a scholar um, and as an academic. And um, it's it's just, it's an award that is over and beyond anything that I could have possibly, you know, dreamed of. So I'm very grateful. Congratulations. I, I, I really understand why they gave this book that award. Um, it makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Well, well, so tell us how you came to write this award-winning book. Yeah. <laughs> Right, I'm still getting, nice still getting, day, right? still getting used to that, but yeah, I can get used to that. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, so you know, as you as you mentioned, um, I'll just kind of say a little bit more about myself and you know, and and the trajectory from you know my beginning until now. Um, so I'm in the philosophy department currently at Fairfield University, uh, which is in Connecticut. I've been there for about 15 years. Um, and I joined uh, Fairfield right after finishing up my graduate work at the University of Memphis. And so at Memphis, um, that at Memphis, I worked with Robert Bernasconi, um, who eventually um, ended up sharing my dissertation. Um, and so Robert was pretty instrumental in helping me come to what ended up being that dissertation work on Emmanuel Levinas and John Paul Sartre. Um, so there's that, and then I should also say be- before getting to Memphis, um, I was I was in college, um, and you know coming to Memphis and being in the U.S. in general as an international student, right? So I was born and sort of raised, came to adulthood in Trinidad, um, and and I think that bio- biographical bit about me is kind of significant when it comes to how I came to writing this book. Um, because a big part of my experience as an international student, right, and especially from a place like Trinidad, was that it sort of took me quite some time to figure out, I should say, how to navigate U.S. codes of racialization, right? And in the South, no doubt, right? So I went to Spelman College in Atlanta, and then I moved from Atlanta to Memphis, right, um, for my graduate work. Um, So I say all of that to say that coming out of Memphis, having written this dissertation on Levinas 
and Sartre um, was also very much alongside my still trying to figure out at that time what and who I was as an international woman of color in the U.S., right? Um, and, and not feeling very confident at all in having any kind of chops to think through or talk about those questions in any meaningful or philosophical way, right? Um, and so, so really what, what might seem to be a, a sharp turn in my trajectory, right, from writing a book, um, so my first book was on Tatra and Levinas, right? Um, so from, from writing that, <laughs> that book, um, which was really a book that dealt with questions of alterity, ethical responsibility, free subjectivity, to, to this book on, on a creolizing account of community, community formation and world making. Um, it might seem like a sharp turn in my trajectory, but it really isn't quite that much of a shift. Um, yeah, because I think that the, the, the set of concerns that drove um, not only my first book on Levinas and Sartre, um, but also what drew me to Levinas in the first place, right? Concerns like the possibility of an ethical politics, the, the relationship between freedom and responsibility, the intersections between agency and vulnerability, um, and, then, and then the implications of our histories in, in who we are as subjects in the world. Um, th those question sets are precisely what got me into um, the second book on creolizing the nation. So, um, so yeah. So that's that's a that's a a, a short a short summary of um, how I went from there, roughly. Oh, I don't know, twenty years ago to here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, um, and this book really takes on the nation and. And it begins with this very um, discouraging <laughs> tour of the concept of the nation. Um, oh, indeed, yes, yes. Yes, and it's, and it's great because you set it up, you, you make clear in the introduction that um, you're going somewhere liberatory um, and decolonial with the concept of the nation, but then you, you really mire us in the trouble of the nation. Um, so will you talk a bit about that tour um, that we're probably more familiar with and then how you move through that um, that troubling concept to, to open up possibilities with, with Creole. Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I love that question. Um, so, so, you know, so the, 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 the ways in which I came to this book project is really via my interest in creolization more so than my interest in nationist or nationhood. Right. And so, you know, I wanted to use, I came to creolization, again, to go back to my indebtedness to the CBA, um, you know, to really like working and thinking through so many exciting questions with um, folks in that community, right? So, so I came to creolization and I, and I wanted to use it as a frame to try to foreground the kinds of politically salient work that happens at the level of everyday lives um, of, of of these communities on the sort of receiving end of colonial power and domination, right? So, so using creolization as a frame to name sort of uh, quotidian acts and decisions and gestures whose efficacy is not really about, it is about disrupting or, and perhaps only in that moment, the habitus of, um, of, of power and domination, right? And coming up with new ways and more liberatory relationships to that power and domination in ways that shouldn't really be possible, right? Um, so the title of the book, right, is Creolizing the Nation. And I think that at a first glance, readers might be somewhat disappointed that the book really isn't about a, a, a attempts to salvage or redeem nationists. Right. Um, and so as an interesting side, I'll, I'll share this, too, as an interesting side, there, there was an actual subtitle. Right. As most books in our profession usually have. Right. I had I had a, I had a, I had a subtitle because that's kind of what you do. Right. Yeah, I noticed I kept so, looking for it. I was like, I'm I know. Missing. I know. It's like, where, where's the long ass? ass yeah, subtitle? After the colon. Yeah, exactly. Right. right. So, yeah. So there was <laughs> so there was this subtitle floating around during the book's gestation stages and that subtitle was a poetics and politics of community otherwise right 
And yeah, and so, you know, but in conversations with the folks at the press, with my amazing editor, Trevor Perry, who's just phenomenal, um, the decision was made to drop the subtitle for, for what you have now, which is, you know, a much less of a mouthful, right? Um, yeah, so, but in any event, um, I, I bring that, that story up now to really stage what the book is trying to do, which is to say that it's not so much... Um, it's not so much that that nation, its interior logics, its its rubrics for organizing life and economics and space and even time. Um, it's not so much that the nation in itself can facilitate these sorts of liberatory projects that I just alluded to, but instead that these interior logics of um, colonial co coloniality and hierarchy, flattening of differences. That story, what, what I try to say in the book, that story doesn't give a complete account of what actually goes on in these nation spaces because communities are always trying to configure these spaces differently, right? And, and, and trying to do so in ways that condition more human, more liberatory ways of being in the world, right? Um, and so, and so, um, Creolization is a is a is a frame that that I try to argue allows us to name such practices, right? That are oftentimes aesthetic, oftentimes cultural, or some space in between those two, right? Um, so, uh, but like you said, right? So, so I the, the book starts off in chapter one um, uh, by trying to lay out some key moments of you know, what readers would probably know as the problematic logic of nationness, right? Um, and so in that chapter, I, I summarize um, what in modes of national organization show up as the sort of metaphysics of the one, right? And, and there I'm really quite indebted to, um, to a book uh, that, uh, a book by Ricardo Sinin Restrepo, um, his book, Decolonizing Democracy, which I believe came out in 2016, right? And so what that book shows is that under this metaphysics, this metaphysics of the one, the particularities of our here and now are so often measured in these, uh, uh, in these terms of, of static, sort of platonic um, conceptions of truth, right? So there's, there are either these perfect replicas or copies, or, or there's what fails to properly replicate the, the truth of this metaphysical oneness, right? Um, and, and those failed replicas um, then in, in, in more standard nationalistic speech gets vilified, right? Um, and so, um, you know, to, it, it, in the book, um, and we can, we can get into the specifics of these terms later on, but in the book and the way I turn to um, theorists like uh, Edward Glissant, um, I give us, I, I, I juxtapose this way of organizing space and time with um, more rhizomatic uh, conceptions of organizing space and time. So that the book really is moving between this uh, dichotomy between uh, root conceptions of community versus rhizomatic conceptions of community. Right. And so um, I give a, I, in to go back to chapter one, I give a synopsis about the linearity of national time and the singularity of national ground. And in both of these accounts, my aim is uh, really to draw attention to the ways in which these narratives around legitimacy, right, legitimate belonging, fitting into a, a, a temporal story of belonging le legitimately as opposed to blasphemously um, are really central to modes of organization that are national in kind. Um, and so, so, so root or stock, which emerges um, as, as though it's coming out of some unbroken linear line collecting, uh, connecting some mythic past or history to the present. Um, and, and then I and then I, I bring in these more creolizing metaphors and conceptions um, to not only problematize that, but but to say that that more that dominant accounting of national space is really missing something significant and vital um, that's going on in that in that national space. Yeah, and this is you take us one of the metaphors you use is about the way that um, the nation gets jostled. Right, like the uh, creolization is a form of jostling, and 
And so you take us into these histories and practices of creolization um, to look at what's happened, as you mentioned, to time and space in creolizing communities, to what's already, you, you give us this archive, right? You give us all of these both historical and contemporary practices. Um, and so part of what you seem to be doing, I think, is trying to say, not only give that sort of the root narrative of the nation, but show how that's never been true. Um, and so is that an apt way to think about about the turn to creolization? Right. Yeah, yes, 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 it actually is, right? So so not only right, so never been true insofar as it's not the entirety of what of what happened, right? And so if if your if your commitment and your investment is, you know, giving an account or coming up with a theory or or, or turning to a concept that can appropriately name, I think not ignoring or 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 or, or, or a, not giving a name to these jostling practices is just quite simply not giving a full picture of what is happening yeah, right it's um, conceptualization <laughs> yes yes exactly exactly right and 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 your tools the, the the conceptual tools that you turn to is is um really preventing you from seeing and naming what is there to be seen and named Right. Um, so, so, so very much yes to how you just conceptualize that. Right. So, um, and so, the, and so, I should say too that the book doesn't detail this archive per se. Right. These practices of creolization as practices that both resist and refuse the totalizing narratives of domination. Um, but it does try to work out a, a frame from which that archive again can be both read and understood. Right. Yes. And, and so, yeah, exactly. And yeah, so, right. mm-hmm. in this in this more creolizing um, account or, or or narrating of the nation, um, my hope is that, or well, my hope is to show that, right, that we might uh, recall the ways in which these marginalized communities have always dreamed in blasphemies, right? So that's a that's a phrase that I um, borrow from the scholar Michelin Critchlow, um, and then to name that that in particular as a mode of liberation politics, right? Dreaming and blasphemies. Yeah. And then and then secondly, um, you know, this frame of creolization urges us to, to take that practice of dreaming and blasphemies into account as as we think about not only possibilities for our future politics of liberation, uh, but also, and this I, I think is is kind of really key and central to what I try to do in the book, to also but but to also look at our present political landscape, right, as maybe already containing these spaces or liminal sites or, or wounds even, right, um, in which normativities of violence, like you said, are being jostled, being robbed of, of, of this their so called last word, right? Um, and and it, it, in ways that open up to something otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, and the the person who helps you do, I think, a lot of thinking about this, and you've already mentioned him, is Glissant, um, and particularly images like the rhizome, um, the importance of opacity in his work. Um, so, you, will you will you take us through a bit about how um, about the resources that Glissant gives you theoretically for thinking? Yeah, realism? yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and so I mean, my again discovery of Glissant um, as as not only a a thinker, but a thinker who is positioned really interestingly at this intersection of um, uh, Caribbean philosophy or theory um, and what, you know, folks in our profession uh, would call uh, continental philosophy or continental thinking, right? (laughs) And and, um, he's been so helpful to me because He's allowed me to engage in the the phenomenological method in ways that are particularly and uniquely attentive to um, the, the the uniqueness of a Caribbean geography um, or a, or a global South geography um, more broadly, right? Um, and this rhizome of the metaphor um, is really all wrapped up in that, right? So. So, um, so yeah, so, so to say a bit more about this rhizome metaphor, um, and folks who would read the book would definitely um, be able to recall um, a thinker like Deleuze, 
and and but I should stay, I right so I should say here that that you know on my understanding um, and and many folks who use Glissant uh, read him in this way um, he he's doing something with um, with notions of the rhizome and rhizomaticity um, that that are uniquely connected or uniquely primed for thinking through very geographically specific questions, um, right? And so, uh, so although there are connections to be made between uh, what Glissant is doing and what someone like Deleuze is doing, I think it's I think it's most productive to read Glissant on his own terms, right? For that for those geographic for those geographical purposes. Um, so um, so yeah so so you know so often <clears throat> to go back to this rhizo metaphor so so often in you know broad scholarship on creolization right so not only Glissant's work but particular Glissant's work um, this uh, the metaphor of 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 not only the rhizome but the metaphor of the mangrove appears right um, and and so my way of thinking through uh, rhizome versus roots um uh has used this imagery or this um uh this this uh botanical metaphor i should say of the mangrove um you know uh quite centrally um and that's because the 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 salience of this of the the mangrove growth right is because it grows in this rhizomatic way right its root growth is across and zigzagging and it's it spreads wide instead of deep right so this wide and not deep um figures quite centrally in what uh, what what i mean and what the book means by creolizing the nation right um but in any event so what what's what's salient about the mangrove is that um you know the a, a mangrove growth is is what happens or what grows in swampy water Right, so you have this uh, meeting or this intersection of fresh water into, um, but fresh water that that the salt of the sea is 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 entering or bleeding into. Right, so so it's this swampy water, and so wh what I what I try to sort of play around with is that if we could maybe articulate a kind of politics of the mangrove, right, we would say that that firstly. There's this emergence and enactment of life out of something that shouldn't really be able to support life, right? So the brine and the salt of the swamp. And then secondly, as this mangrove is, is sort of making life happen um, out of this particular not conducive to life ground, what it's doing, and, and perhaps quite inadvertently, one might say, what it's doing is is it's stopping erosion. It's it's actually affecting the landscape and, and the architecture of that landscape, right? So it's 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 making that landscape. It, it's it's transforming it into something that must now reckon with the life generating work of this man of this mangrove. And so the landscape, you know, in, in this particular metaphor in my head, the landscape is the nation and its architecture. And so the zigzaggy rhizome roots of the mangrove um, is, to my mind, uh, a metaphor for these liminal practices of freedom that make life out of brine um, and, or, or, you know, make, make a way where no way should really be possible um, that creolization tries tries to theorize and so and so what I want to say is that what I what, what I want to offer is not some sort of uh, saving narrative of nationness but to say that um, there is there is something always already happening in in within the space of what looks like at face value um, a, a, a simply and solely violating or a violent logics of nationists, but there's something happening that the nation must reckon with. Right. Yeah. The mangrove. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So. Well, and then so then you connect to this other um, this other um, body of work in Latina feminism, and it it may it especially given what you just said, it makes so much sense when you do it in the book. But as you also point out, it's not often done, right? This connection um, between these, these, these literatures is not often done. Um, 
And so you turn to people like Lugonas and Enzel Duin, Ortega, um, especially to think through subjectivity in this project, um, to think about difference and coherence, ambiguity and homemaking. Um, so, so, so tell us tell us about bridging these literatures, and especially about how it helps you think about about history and nature. Yes, yes, yeah. So it was right. So I mean, I would say, and this could just simply be particular to my 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 process and my um, and the way I, I think about things. So so often I kind of um, get clarity on the questions that's mulling around in my head by by the pure accident of what happens to be on my desk to get together at the same point in time, right? And so, I mean, I I, I, I wish I had like a more profound um, account, <laughs> accounting of how I, I came into this intersection, but it just so happened, right? So I'm a huge, um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Mariana Ortega's work. Um, I'm not just, not just Mariana Ortega's work, but who Mar who Marianne is as a person. Um, so, you know, I was reading through his her, her, her work um, when it came out and, um, you know, she, she kind of, and, and, and her book was really kind of leading me into these uh, various avenues. So I was um, thinking through the Gonis and Florian Saldua, um, but at the same time, um, reading, uh, you know, Guisan's Poetics of Relation and reading Guisan's Caribbean Discourse. And so when I, when I kind of, Came, when this book came into focus, um, these connections were like super obvious to me. And so my, my plans for the book was to just just present the archive of, of thinkers who were thinking through these intersections and came to find out there was not really anyone thinking through these intersections. Guissant was not talking about Anzal Dua. Um, I found one article by Lugones where she like footnoted Glissant in in this piece. I couldn't I can't remember the name of the article or when it came out. And that was it. And I was like I was I was sh I was shocked and 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 just kind of moved because the connections in my mind, like the ways that these two bodies of of uh, of of work um was thinking through these questions of homemaking and and ambiguity and subject formation just seemed really primed to speak to each other. And so that's kind of how <laughs> that's kind of how chapter four came to be um, a part of this project. So um, you know, for, for, for anyone out there who feels as though they're groping in the dark, there is value to that. So just hang tight is what I is what I would say. <laughs> yeah. um, I yeah. mean, you know, um, it's unnerving, but you know, it 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 works out sometimes in so many interesting ways. But anyway, yeah, so, yeah it really bore right? fruit, yeah, for your project, yeah. totally. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm I was I was I was happy. I was happy the way in which this intersection really opened up the book. Um, Right, so so on, you know, in the book and on my reading, these thinkers like Anzal Dua and Lugones and Ortega are really also grappling with these questions of belonging, identity making, um, that has to be that 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 so often begins in a kind of historical fragmentation, right, or liminality, right, or or you know, to be to be um, to, to paraphrase from Ortega's work, from this kind of in betweenness, right. Um, and so what, what, what really drew me to this, to this, you know, to bringing, bringing together these constellations of thinkers, um, is, is that they they, they all seem to give us language, metaphors, concepts to understand how communities that are shaped in conquest and colonial violence live their lives in ways that are never entirely determined by that historical violence. And, and that to me is, um, being able to name that and think through that has so many significant implications, not just in terms of theory, but in terms of activism and practice, right? Because we have we have we have this really robust accounting of what historical violence is, um, and and I always feel like more can be said about um, the 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 in inventive and and liberatory ways that folks shaped in conquest 
um, figure out how to live lives that are never entirely determined by that conquest, right? And so that's really what the book tries to do. Um, and so that way of being in relationship to history without being entirely determined by that, by that history is precisely what um, Glissant's story about Caribbean creolization is all about. Um, and, and so I try to show in, in, this chap, in this chapter, I believe it's chapter four, I try to show how um, concepts like Lugonis' playful world traveling and curdling, how Ortega's account of, of a multiplicity South is really giving us a very similar story. Right, how, or, or attempting to grapple with how we might understand ourselves as coming out of a particular history, um, without being, without never entirely being um, of that history, in this sense. So, yeah, so yeah. yeah I, well, no, I mean, just as you said, it's not just theoretically, but practically, a really exciting chapter in in how it brings together um, possibility, sometimes out of what seems what seems like. Um, you know, historical forces that are just shutting down all possibility. Absolutely, right, right, and 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 that and that and that way of totalizing of of accounting for those historical forces as as totalizing um, is really key, right? Because I think without understanding the pervasiveness of it, is to is to not understand in a full productive way what we're up against, right? But that accounting of 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 per- pervasiveness. Uh, to my mind, should never be at the price of um, undercounting or undernaming all these other things that are happening at the same time. Yeah, and this is, I see you make this move in the book a few times, such as with the concept of the nation or with this history of violence, that you really you really um, give a full account of, of you, you don't soft sell the violence or the, the totalizing nature of the concept of the nation, right? But then you give us more by moving through that. Yes, exactly. It's a, it's a, it's a sort of, uh, you know, and I mean, I, I would say this, right. So, so, I mean, this is always something, this is always a, um, a, a, a line that I try to establish um, when I teach, when I teach classes about these sorts of issues and, and work through these sorts of texts. And very often I find that, you know, how you get to that line, how you maneuver into that line is very dependent on who your audience is or, or who the folks are in the room, right? And so, you know, some audiences are really primed to, to want to hear um, that, that you know, colonial violence and domination really isn't that bad because look at all of the amazing things, right? Look at all the amazing things that the global South and folks of color have been able to do. Look, they made, they made the blues and they made hip hop and it's so wonderful, right? But, right, and so, and so I, in the book, I try, I try to present the book as a text that is, is not, is not meant to, um, convince that kind of audience or to convince that kind of readership um, of how awful colonial domination is, right, and its attending violences. But to say that, yes, we get it. This is a, 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 a historical force that perhaps humanity has never seen in the history of, of, of humaning, right? We get that. But what are some of the other things that... Um, needs to be foregrounded given how clear it is that colonial violence is as awful as it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and so, and so given that, especially it's not surprising you do take us to Fanon in the book. Um, and it makes, I wrote down your subtitle, a, a poetics and politics of community. Otherwise was that? Yeah. So, so if, if Glissant, is on the poetic side, right? Then, then Latina feminisms, and and then really Fanon gives us the politics, right? You're bring, you're bringing us through uh, absolutely, and there's a connect, right? Like what this allows you to do, the way you develop it allows you to show the interrelationship of the poetics and the politics. Um, absolutely. All right, so so let's talk about um, about nationalism for Fanon and and what work that allows you to do. Yes. Yeah, yeah, um, right. And so, you know, this was a this was also another sort of 
um, natural point of connection, you know, for me as I as I was looking through the book, um, and I know that the, the, there is indeed lots of good good work um, out there that that brings together what Guisant is doing um, in the in the like you said poetic register um, alongside what Fanon is doing in the more overtly um, sort of anti-colonial revolutionary political gestures. So so I really see. Um, the 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 the, chap, the chapters in the book that 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 talk about Fanon as um as as entering into an already quite robust conversation, um right and so so the the this the reading of Fanon that I offer and this is towards the end of the book this the last chapter of the book um tries to center what to my understanding are really possibilities of thinking about fluid negotiations with the past. Um, very much like what we find um, in the kind of temporal uh, bricolage is is a is a is a is a term and a concept that floats around in um, creolization literature quite a lot, right? So so the idea of um, the past coming into the present to generate something for the future that is that is otherwise than the changing theme of of the past of past violence, right? Um, and so, and so, all that to say, um, reading Fanon in a way that 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 is able to show how the past and potentially the future is not is not quite overdetermined by that. How, how the present and the future, sorry, is not is not entirely overdetermined by the past, right? Um, and so, um, you know, so a lot of this is really uh, thanks. To you know, really formative conversations that I had with um, with Jean Gordon, right? Again, uh, someone who um, is part of that CPA community. Um, you know, and I have I have lots of thanks to give to her while working on this project. She really um, uh, open to having these conversations with me. Um, but this one in particular, right? Um, so I, so in this chapter, I I use the story that Fanon gives us about. The transistor radio, right? The, tra- um, the 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 transformations of um, its cultural and political meanings um, at that at that moment, at that historical moment in Algeria, as they were coming into the Algerian Revolution, right? Um, in in their fight for independence against against France, right? So I use that as as an example that comes directly from Fanon to give. A concrete shape to what I mean by these fluid negotiations with, with the past um, and fluid negotiations with negotiations with power, right? So my my turn to Fanon in that chapter is perhaps to say something like this: Fanon's anti-colonial revolutionary politics um, would or could be read or, or or could be understood as a political modality of Guisant's more poetic articulations of compositeness. And rhizomaticity and errantry, right? So, so in other words, a turn to Fanon, um, or my turn to Fanon, I should say, is to say that a uh, uh, Fanonian politics of decolonization would have, at the level of the everyday, um, these transformative processes, right? The radio, the transistor radio, for instance, moving from a sign of French colonial domination in the home to the radio being a sign of solidarity with the Algerian revolutionary fight for sovereignty, right? Right, so the, these, trans, these transformative processes um, are processes that are not unlike what in both uh, Guissant and, and theories of creolization more broadly name as these creolizing adaptations, right, with, which offer more liberatory relationships to power without necessarily toppling or undermining that power, but figures out a way to be in a more liberatory relationship with it, right? Um, and so, uh, so, so, so all of this isn't to say that, that, that everyone, that everyone can locate these creolizing as adaptations or one can, um, well, let me say, let me say this differently. What I'm not, what I'm not saying is that you know, everywhere you find these creolizing adaptations, you can expect something like a Fanonian anti-colonial revolution, 
right? That, that, that's not what I'm saying, and that's not what the book is saying. But the book does want to say, as a matter of, of cultural and, and poetic sets of inventive practices, um, these underground uh, working out, this underground working out of different ways of relationship to power is not only sort of key for conditions of possibilities of this colonial otherwise that Fanon imagines, but more importantly, that we can use creolization to name these different ways of relating to power, right? Um, and so and so, my turn to Fanon towards the end of the book is, is in the spirit of, um, it, uh, it is in the spirit of, of at least beginning a conversation at the intersection of, 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 of a cultural politics or a poetics and politics, um, sort of big upper P politics, um, you know, in a more explicit sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, yeah, yeah no, that's so helpful. And, um, and gives us a way of thinking about, again, at the theoretical level, but also in lived experience of, of the everyday, right? Like how things could hang together. Um, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's so often the case that, you know, these things that are happening to us or through us or with us at the level of the everyday, it's so easy to, to lose sight um, of, of the liberatory implications of those. Right, um, and because they're not, they're not, they're not big, and and their gestures aren't like fancy or sexy, but, it, but you know, it's it's they're all they're all meaningful, and I think you you couldn't really make sense of those more big, fancy, exclusive political moments without paying attention to all these things at the at the level of the everyday that had to have happened and continues to happen to make that those more bigger picture moments possible. So, yeah. 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 Well, and so your your conclusion is titled um, Creolizing as an Imperative. Um, and and here you it's a you you know anticipate that you're gonna make this move in the introduction, but it's this is where you really um, begin to have a conversation with indigenous scholars and especially Jude Bird and Glenn Coltard. Um, and so, and so why imperative, right? Like what is, what's imperative about, um, about what's happening here in this, this, um, move from what you've been doing in the book to connect it to indigenous, um, theory and activism and, and scholarship? Yeah. Yeah. No, um, I, I, I really appreciate that question. Um, because I, I think, I think how I, how I, how I end the book is more, um, more valuable to me than than probably any other part of the book. Um, so and so yeah, right. It's like oh, this is not this is not done. This is just beginning. No, this is where I am now. Yeah, this is all yeah. done and finished. I, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. This is yeah. just kind of like working out the kinks and setting up the frames. So and so here the work now begins is is really how I think about the last the, you know towards the, the very very end of the book. Um, and so I think. Um, you know, F Fanon, to go back to Fanon, Fanon's critique of, um, you know, what he, what he understood as a kind of ultra nationalism might be a good way, a good entry point into this question. Um, and so I end the book, uh, with this turn of phrase, right? Creolizing as an imperative, uh, really as a way to keep thinking about creolization as what's always giving the community, what's always giving communities the capacity to orient themselves in these unexpected ways, right? Specifically, ways that don't reproduce systems of violence, but rather gesture towards some other possibilities or some other kind of world making or being with each other, right? Um, and so by the book's end, I try to make it clear that, that, that these possibilities towards which creolizing imaginaries can, can lead us are to be read at just that, right? In the register of possibilities, right? The political effects, of which are not, um, it's not really about offering clearly delineate, delineated structures or codes, um, but instead, right, how these imaginaries contest with the very talos of, of existing power, right? Um, and so what emerges through this undoing of power's claim to legitimacy is, is, an, is an otherwise that we can think of as maybe op 
opaquely so, like opaquely otherwise, right? So radically outside the the frame that power is giving us, um, and and that is being contested at the same time, right? Um, and so, uh, so, so I I would say that what I've offered as a properly creolizing account of the nation uh, is is an attempt to center this imaginary or this this politics as something that is that that be, in order for it to be sufficiently otherwise so as to orient the nation in this particular way towards a future that has not yet to come right and i and i want and i want to say that um out of this kind of reframing uh something like closure um uh or or, or a sort of delinea uh, clearly delinearly delineated end right towards which we're going um close that kind of closure would show up as premature um and stasis would show up as as a kind of failure right to do what um you know what amy allen urges in her book which is really what prompted this amy allen's book is really what gave me the language to to to, to say what i wanted to say um in this sense um, you know, so, so stasis would show up as, as a kind of failure to not do what um, Amy Allen's book says, which is to enact this project of decoupling progress as an imperative um, from progress as a fact, right? And that's a, that's a, that's a paraphrase from, um, from Amy Allen's book. Um, and so, you know, in that spirit, what, um, you know, what, 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 what that has brought me to um, at this point, right, towards the end of the book, and this is sort of where I am right now, is to think about creolization. Um, is, I really want to think about creolization in this way, given what, what I saw as I was bringing the book to an end, and I continue to see, is in, in this possible encounter between creolizing communities, right? So, so folks that are, um, that emerge in these experiences of diaspora, transplantation, movement, um, an encounter between those sorts of creolizing communities and indigenous communities, right? Communities that really have a very different relationship to land and landedness, um, and who actually also figure in the story of colonial conquest, but figure so in a way that's very different, right, from creolizing, um, by cre from creolizing identities. Um, and so it's really with these sets of questions that I conclude the book, um, and 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 I sort of on purpose, um, you know, lay out these questions in order to to, to single to, to 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 signal a kind of um, incompleteness in the project, and by by turning towards questions and and problem spaces that you know creolization generates, um, but might ask us to go beyond the frame of creolization itself. Um, to think more productively about. So, so yeah. So that's kind of why I felt compelled to um, to to sort of end the book with not a closing but an opening and an invitation. Yeah, I mean, it seems so true to your concept of creolizing. You know, right? Yeah, like, I know. Yeah, it doesn't exactly. set up the metaphysics of the one. <laughs> no, it does not. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. does not. It's yeah, not. That it's not comfortable it's very uncomfortable right. that's a good word so. cause it's, pretty, it's not pat right it's not like right. and that's the end yeah exactly yeah. exactly and in, the, in this sense i think you know if i could say this way i think that um you know my levinasian underwear is still showing right so this, <laughs> this, this idea of like you know it's not about like oh okay we have like an ethics now and we can move on to something else like right. it is it is meant to end sort of uncomfortably yeah 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 well, um, so what are you working on now? Yeah, so right to go back to the uncomfortableness. <laughs> um, yeah, so I have. Uh, I guess you could. I can. You. I can describe it. I have these uh, two sort of separate projects going on right now, but I. I think they all. You know, as I work through them, I think I could see them pointing to um, like like a, one common space, right? Um, in other words, two streams that could really end up being part of a larger single project. Um, so, so the first one um, is really about these uh, preliminary questions around creolization and indigeneity. Um, and so I have that in paper form right now, and I'm trying to pursue 
these two questions, right? So, so the first question, um, how to think about the often unavoidable anti-blackness with which decolonization pursues indigenous restoration and land rep uh, repatriation, and then two, the often unavoidable settler logics within which a politics of black abolition can pursue the possibility of thinking black and free together, right? Um, and so I can, you know, at least for now, you know, I'm continuing to, to use Edward Glitzan's conceptions of opacities in relation to argue that opacity is something, is a frame that we could use to sort of center these two um, sets of questions, you know, and, and bring and, and to understand what happens when it comes to doing when we try to do decolonizing and abolitionist work together. So that's that's the sort of first project, and you know, as you could probably tell, it's it's very much an inheritance of of where the book ended, right? Yeah, um, and then the second project, um, again, I, which could definitely connect to this. This first one, um, I'm really I'm, I'm I'm currently thinking through questions of living blackness, black resistance, and practices of freedom, just very broadly in a context of anti-black violence, right? Um, and so as a as a as a theory, creolization, at least so far, allowed me to frame such questions um, in the context of black life rules in the Americas, right? Who you know where the starting point sort of quote unquote starting point as it were is you know the radical rupture of the experience of the middle passage um and so in this in this last book um you know the, the, thinking through those questions were really curtailed or or um or framed specifically in the in the context of the nation right um but this Sort of newer emerging project, I think, wants to move beyond the boundaries of the nation question, right? And perhaps, perhaps also beyond, you know, the the, the grounding that creolization can offer as a concept, right? To so think through, you know, more general questions of of how we can name practices of freedom that unfold, um, that can unfold against the context of unfreedom, right? And so I'm um, uh, I'm thinking through. Um, what Octavia Butler does in her work. Um, I'm, th I'm using, I'm turning to Ashil Mbembe's work, um, Catherine McKittrick, Alexandra Mohaley, Tiffany King. So I'm super excited about this, about where this might, where this might take me. So, yeah. Uh, I can't, I can't wait to, to see these projects. This is great. I appreciate that. Me neither. I can't wait. I'll let you know. I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you again, Chris Seeley, for this this wonderful conversation. Absolutely. And thank you for again for inviting me and just in general for you know the work that, that you're doing, Sarah. Like these conversations are I think super important to our community and, and I for one thoroughly enjoy the podcast. So I appreciate it. Oh, well, your thanks work. so much. Well, this I, I have to admit the it's been a hard pandemic, but getting to have these conversations has really kept me going. Right. So, I know, yeah. I know, indeed. Indeed. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much.